The purpose of this video is to provide general information and education about the care of a critically ill child. It is in no way a substitute for the independent decision making and judgment by a qualified health care professional. The information contained in this video should not be used to make a diagnosis or to overrule the advice of a qualified health care provider, nor should it be used to provide advice for emergency medical treatment. Asthma by Dr. Gerhard Wolf. Hello, my name is Dr. Gerhard Wolf. I work at the Division of Critical Care Medicine at Children's Hospital Boston. I will be talking about asthma today. We're going to review the epidemiology and pathophysiology of acute and severe asthma. I will describe the current management strategies in the pediatric ICU, and we will talk about considerations for the pediatric intensivist taking care of a ch child with severe asthma. Terminology. Asthma is a very common disease, in fact, the most common disease of childhood, and that's why it's very likely that as pediatric intensivists, we will encounter a child with asthma in the pediatric ICU. The terminology of asthma has been quite confusing, and let me just present to you a child with wheezing, an intercurrent viral illness, and who presents with respiratory distress. How are we going to call this diagnosis? Do we call it reactive airway disease? Do we call it wheezy bronchitis, asthmatic bronchitis, wheezing associated respiratory illness, parainfectious bronchial hyperactivity, or asthma? Probably all of those terms can be used and are sort of suitable as a diagnosis. Reactive airway disease is a recurrent viral induced wheezing that occurs in toddlers. And asthma describes a more chronic condition, has several triggers, respiratory infections being one of them and usually has a poor prognosis for spontaneous resolution. Pathophysiology. I want to show you a chest radiograph. This is out of a New England Journal review article. And on panel A, you see a chest X-ray AP, very hyperinflated lungs, typical in asthma. The big arrows show some subcutaneous air uh, associated with possible pneumometastinum. And on B, in the big arrow, you can see a big anterior pneumothorax. All those can be complications that we see in patients with severe asthma in the intensive care no uh, unit. Note also the areas of atelectasis as you see pointed out by the small arrows here. Let me take you through the normal airway and the asthmatic airway. On the left side, you see an image of the normal airway. You see the smooth muscle cells, the fibroblasts, and the capillaries. The role of the smooth muscles in healthy patients is to provide support of the airway and to facilitate gas exchange as well as to help with mucus clearance. On the right side you see the airway of a patient with asthma and as you can see the number of the smooth muscle cells is increased as is the size of the smooth muscle cells. And in asthma the smooth muscle cells mediate much of the pathology we see, the bronchoconstriction, the hyperresponsiveness, the inflammation, Medications. Let me talk to you about managing asthma exacerbations. And all those uh, recommendations come from the recommendations of the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, uh, the guidelines for the diagnosis of management of asthma released in 2007. Beta agonists, as we know, is one of the mainstay of therapies, therapies in patients with asthma but only selective beta-2 agonists are recommended. Albuterol is one of the main beta agonists we, beta-2 agonists we use in asthma at the dose of 0.15 mg per kilo every 20 minutes or as a continuous nebulization at 0.5 mg per kilo per hour. We should use inhaled beta agonists if possible. The efficacy of IV or intravenous beta agonists is unproven. We do use terbutaline or other intravenous beta-2 agon agonists if we have a patient with asthma exacerbation who's already on continuous NEBS. But normally, inhaled beta agonists have much less side effects and a greater efficacy than IV beta agonists. And the recommendation is to stay away from drugs like isoproteinol, which both have beta-1 and beta-2 effects, since there's more uh, side effects of cardiac toxicity involved with those drugs. Epinephrine can be used in an asthma attack and has been used. 
because apart from being a vasoconstrictor, it's also a bronchodilator. It has both alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2 activities. And if it's given an asthma attack, it's normally given subcutaneously at the dose of 0.01 milligram per kilo up to a total dose of 0.3 or 0.5 milligrams. Again, epinephrine is a non-selective beta agonist, as it also has alpha activities. So we do, if we do expect more cardiac side effects if we do use epinephrine. Anticholinergics reduce the vagal tone of the airways, and ipertropian bromide has been used at 0.25 milligrams every 20 minutes. Corticosteroids are important to reduce inflammation in the airways in a patient with an asthma attack, because apart from vasoconstriction, the inflammation is a main component of the disease. We usually use prednisone at a dose of 1 mg per kilogram every 6 hours for 48 hours, or methylprednisolone IV at the same dose, and after 2 days we normally use 2 mg per kilogram per day. Magnesium has been used in asthma attacks, and uh, it works as an antagonist to calcium on the smooth muscles, and therefore mediates bronchodilation, and much of the data supporting magnesium comes from studies in the emergency room, where patients who received magnesium in some studies has a, had a lower rate of admissions to the hospital. We typically use magnesium at the same dose as we would use it in resuscitation, which is 2 grams IV in an adult patient or in a larger child, or otherwise 25 to 50 milligrams per kilogram. The following treatments are not recommended in a patient with asthma attack by the guidelines or by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute and their guidelines 2007. Theophylline is usually not recommended. Antibiotics are not routinely recommended. If a patient has a pneumonia or sinusitis, it should be treated. Aggressive hydration therapy is not recommended. Chest physiotherapy can be stressful for the child with asthma and can lead to increased coughing and worsen hypoxia and is therefore not recommended and is not beneficial. Uh, the same applies for mucolytics that are not routinely recommended, and sedation is not recommended. Although patients or children with an asthma attack often present with a large amount of anxiety, sedation can lead to worsening uh, respiratory failure as it can lead to respiratory depression. Endotracheal intubation. Now, about 5 to 10 percent of all children who get admitted to the ICU with an asthma attack will get intubated. And what should we base our decision to intubate a child with asthma on? It is mainly based on clinical judgment and on arterial blood gas analysis, such as worsening acidosis or rising carbon dioxide levels, uh, if a patient has more and more exhaustion, or has in general impending respiratory failure, which means a patient has not, does not have the full degree of respiratory failure yet, but we, we think he will fail in the next half an hour. This is impending respiratory failure, and we should intubate those patients before they have a respiratory or cardiac arrest. Depressed mental status can be an indication to intubate, as well as refractory hypoxemia and hemodynamic instability. When we think about intubating a patient with asthma, we have to think about cardiopulmonary interactions. The first cardiopulmonary interaction that comes to mind is decreased preload. The preload of a patient with asthma may be decreased because he has been in, ill for a couple of days. He may have had decreased fluid intake. He may have had an intercurrent illness with fever. And he's probably been tachypnic in the setting of his asthma attack, leading to increased insensible water losses. Also, his lungs are hyperinflated, and that may provide some limitation to venous return. We also have to think about his pulmonary vascular resistance. In a patient with an asthma attack who has a fair amount of bronchoconstriction, his pulmonary vascular resistance may be increased and his right ventricle may be stressed. The third interaction that comes to mind is the myocardium itself. Patients with hypoxia and acidosis may have decreased myocardial contractility. So all the things we have to keep in mind when we think about intubation of an asthmatic. Here is an image of pulses paradoxes. Panel A shows a, pa uh, a tracing of pulses paradoxes, whereas panel B shows a normal arterial tracing. Pulses paradoxes was described by Kussmaul, 1878, in Vienna, in a patient with constrictive pericarditis. And patients with asthma may have pulses paradoxes as well. What Kussmaul actually found paradox in a patient with pulses paradoxes is that he had a regular precordial activity, 
but the when he felt the pulse of that patient during inspiration, there was a decrease in pulse pressure and a decrease in pulse amplitude. So pulses paradoxes in inspiration, there is a fall in blood pressure as you see on the top graph. And why would a patient with asthma have pulses paradoxes? A patient with asthma has hyperinflation of the lungs, and those in, the, in and itself may limit venous return. And when during inspiration there is more venous return normally, the right atrium may not be able to accommodate all that increased blood volume. And therefore the septum may bow over to the left side, in this case limiting left atrial preload and left ventricular preload, leading to a decreased blood pressure. Often patients who are intubated with asthma have a fair amount of pulses paradoxes, which can lead to hypotension during inspiration. So let's talk about strategies for a tracheal intubation. We've talked about decreased preload, so obviously we should consider giving a large volume bolus like 20 cc per kilo of normal saline or 20 cc per kilo of ringer's lactate prior to intubation. When we think about induction agent, agents, we should avoid agents that um, are direct myocardial depressants. What we would typically use is an induction agent like etomidate or ketamine, followed by a little bit of fentanyl or versed. We should avoid agents such as propofol as they may lead to a significant hypotension. And as we choose our endotracheal tube, we should use a cuffed endotracheal tube as we may have to apply higher mean airway pressure pressures later during the course of ventilation so that we don't have a leak around the endotracheal tube. So at Children's Hospital we have often use endotracheal tubes that are cuffed even when they're as small as 3.5. Mechanical ventilation. Let's talk about ventilation of a patient with asthma. Most patients have dynamic pulmonary hyperinflation, or in other words, gas trapping, and you can see that on this panel here. The lower panel is a normal uh, patient who's breathing, and in asthmatic lungs, you can see that there is a fair amount of uh, end expiratory air that remains in the lungs, and that leads to air stacking, which means every subsequent breath, since the lungs are not emptied, stacks on the previous one, and over time, that leads to a fair amount of air trapping or auto peep. Now, how can we measure auto peep? Let me take you through this for a second. During a normal patient, or in normal lungs, at the end of inspiration, say the alveolar pressure is 20. So at the airway opening, we also measure a pressure of 20. Let's look at the normal lungs in end expiration. The alveolar pressure slowly declines until it reaches zero. And so at the airway opening, we also measure a pressure of zero. Now let's look at obstructive physiology. Uh, and you can see the obstruction uh, being marked here by this uh, black obstruction of the airway. Again, at ins inspiration, the alveolar pressure is, for example, 35. And at the airway opening, such as with a pneumotac, we measure a pressure of 35. But now during expiration, since the airway is obstructed, there may be still some air remaining in the alveolus, leading to a pressure of about 15, as in this example. But as there is obstruction, the pressure of the airway opening now reads zero. And only if you do an expiratory hold, slowly the pressure in the alveolus equilibrates through the obstruction with the pressure at the airway opening. And then at the airway opening, you will measure the real pressure, which is now 15. So to measure auto peep in a patient who is intubated and ventilated, this patient has to be either deeply sedated or paralyzed since you have to go through the expiratory hold maneuver. And if a patient is not sedated, he's very tachypnic normally, then you won't be able to measure the auto peep reliably. What are the general goals of mechanical ventilation? As in every patient who's ventilated, we have to assure adequate oxygen delivery. General strategies that also apply to a patient with asthma are to imply low tidal volumes, about five to six per kilo, to have some degree of permissive hypercarbia, to avoid excess plateau pressures, those are pressures that are higher than 35 centimeters of water, in order to prevent barotrauma, and we try to wean the oxygen so that we apply non-toxic oxygen concentrations. And it's really not quite clear what that is in a child. We know that there's well-documented well -document, well oxygen toxicity in neonates, but we usually try to wean, even in children, the FiO2 or the fraction of inspired oxygen to less than 60%. The big question that always comes up in a patient with asthma is how much PEEP should we apply? And there's a couple of teaching opinions that are usually mentioned in textbooks. One classic teaching opinion is that we apply no PEEP. 
And the rationale for that is that we say, okay, a patient with asthma already has a fair amount of auto peep, has a fair amount of air trapping, and so every additional peep will increase air trapping. And this is for sure partially true. The other teaching opinion is that we try to adjust the positive end expiratory pressure to match the auto peep. For example, if we measure an auto peep of 10, we apply a peep of 10. And that comes mainly, I think, from the thought that if a patient triggers on the ventilator, and in older times those ventilators had pressure triggers, he would have to generate a negative pressure at the airway opening. And in order to generate a negative pressure at the airway opening with a fair amount of auto peep, the patient has to overcome the auto peep and would then not be able to trigger on the ventilator. So while it, it is true that extrinsic peep in a patient with asthma may worsen air trapping, we also have to consider that positive end expiratory pressure reduces the work of breathing by splinting the airway open and also PEEP prevent ex end expiratory collapse in the alveolus. So typically our respiratory therapists carefully titrate PEEP by observing tidal volumes, by observing entitled CO2 and flow patterns. And this is, again is a chest x-ray of a one-year-old patient with asthma who is intubated. You can see the endotracheal tube and the lungs look quite over hyperinflated and you can see that the diaphragms are relatively flat but this is not the only pathology we observe here. Perihyler, there is also a fair amount of atelectasis, there is peribronchial coughing. And where does the atelectasis come from? Well, most of these patients with asthma have a lot of mucus. They have um, swelling of the uh, mucous membranes. They have bronchoconstriction. And they, over time, may have a viral or bacterial pneumonia. So they don't only have hyperinflation, but they also have atelectasis. And here is actually where PEEP can be helpful in restoring lung volume. When we think about impaired gas exchange in a patient with asthma, we have to think about hypercarbia and hypoxia. Hypoxia is coming from a patient who has atelectasis that leads to a fair amount of VQ mismatch, which is a mismatch of ventilation and perfusion, and to, leads to intrapulmonary shunting. And intrapulmonary shunting is perfusion without ventilation. And the patient with asthma also has hypercarbia. And the hypercarbia is mediated by air trapping that leads to decreased interalveolar ventilation. But the patient with asthma also has increased intrapulmonary dead space. And again, intrapulmonary de dead space is ventilation of an alveolus without perfusion. And that probably comes through that the, that the alveolus is over hyperinflated and therefore perfusion of that alveolus is impaired. How do we limit gas trapping in a patient with asthma? There's actually three fundamental ways we can do this. We can A, administer a bronchodilator, we can B, increase the expiratory time, and we can C, decrease the tidal volume and decrease the minute ventilation. Because if we have lower tidal volumes, less air is going into the lung and less air has to be exhaled, so air trapping is reduced. Let me show you this effect of an increased expiratory time here on this uh, graph. On the top panel, you can see gas trapping with an inappropriate expiratory time. And you can see that the expiratory flow, delineated by this red circle, does not decelerate to zero. So expiration in this patient is not complete. And if you shorten the inspiratory time at the expense of lengthening the expiratory time, in the lower panel you have a shorter inspiratory time, but now the expiratory time is longer and the expiration is complete. And you can see that because the expiratory flow reaches zero. Let's look at the entitled CO2 waveform of a patient with asthma. On this slide, on the left side, you can see a normal entitled CO2 waveform. So you can see a rapid upstroke of CO2, then it reaches a plateau phase, and at the end of expiration you can see a red circle. And that is actually when the entitled CO2 is measured. And right next to it you see an entitled CO2 waveform of a patient with asthma. You can see that there is a much less steep upstroke of entitled CO2. And why is that? It is because the patient has airway obstruction. So often in a patient with asthma, the entitled CO2 value you can get from the monitor can be inaccurate because, again, it's measured at the end of expiration. And in a patient with obstructive airway disease, expiration at any time may not be complete. Inhaled gases. Heliox is a very light and inert gas and it has the potential to turn turbulent flow into laminar flow. And 
if you nebulize albuterol with heliox, it has the potential that more albuterol is uh, reaching the uh, terminal airways in a patient with asthma. And here you can see a setup. It is connected to an 80-20 heliox cylinder, which means that this uh, gas mixture contains 80% helium and 20% oxygen. And then that drives the nebulizer through which continuous albuterol is nebulized. Heliox has also been used in patients with severe asthma exacerbation just to use on the ventilator. And this is an example of how Heliox can be set up with, an, uh, with a ventilator. Instead of uh, oxygen and fresh gas, Heliox is adjusted, uh, connected to the ventilator. And again, Heliox often comes in 80-20 mixes, which means 80% Heliox and 20% oxygen, or 70% helium and 30% oxygen. And in most ventilators, the O2 calibration uh, really gets out of range when Heliox is used. That's why an external O2 analyzer has been used to get the correct concentration of oxygen. In some newer ventilators, the helium-oxygen mixture can just be plugged in. What about inhalation anesthetics? Isofluorin is the preferred agent, and we know that it's a, sp a strong anesthetic agent, but also a strong bronchodilator, and hence it has been used in patients with asthma. Um, the, side of the primary effect is that you really get an improved ventilation uh, due to its bronchodilatory effects. But there are um, pretty significant side effects that have to be considered when isofluorine is used in the ICU. And those side effects are hypotension. Uh, most uh, patients with asthma, once they have a severe ex asthma exacerbation, are at risk for hypotensive episodes. And um, hence, we often place a central line before we start the patient on uh, isofluorin. And we also have a vasopressor or an inotrope, such as dopamine, ready to infuse in case the patient has a drop in blood pressure. And here is how isofluorin can be administered. This is a Servo 900C ventilator at this point, And you can see that an isofluorin vaporizer is attached to it. And on top, you see a monitor through which the uh, minimal alveolar concentration of isofluorin can be measured. Sedating the intubated asthmatic. Let's talk about sedation once a patient is ventilated. The standard sedation regimen that we use would be midazolam and morphine because we use it in other patients who are ventilated as well. In a patient with asthma, alternatives come to mind, for example, ketamine, because ketamine has some bronchodilatatory effect as well as isofluorine for sedation, because it also has a bronchodilator effect, as you've seen before. With all sedation effects, you have to consider that the patient has hemodynamic side effects, such as hypotension. And once the patient uh, is weaned off the ventilator, typically after he's been on morphine and midazolam for more than five days, you have to consider that the patient will withdraw from those medications, so you have to taper and wean the, uh, the sedation accordingly. What about neuromuscular blockade in a patient with asthma? We try, as in all patients, not to paralyze uh, patients with asthma on a ventilator. However, sometimes it becomes necessary when there is a very pronounced patient ventilator asynchrony. The complications that we are uh, fearful of are critical illness, myopathy, especially when patients receive both steroids, as asthmatics do, and neuromuscular block blocking agents. The strategies we try to implement whenever we paralyze a patient with asthma is that we give him a paralytic holiday at least once a day and let him wake up and uh, show that he moves around a little bit. And we can also use peripheral nerve stimulation to assess the deepness of uh, paralysis. So let's summarize again what we talked about during, uh, for ventilation during asthma. We try to use a strategy where we have low tidal volumes and a low respiratory rate Again, a low respiratory right to give the patient a proper expiratory time. We can try to shorten the inspiratory time at the expense of the expiratory time. That can help to make the expiratory time even longer. And we have to constantly monitor for the development of dynamic hyperinflation and air trapping. Thank you very much. That concludes our video on asthma. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video? Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments?
You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Note, feedback is not required to complete this activity in the Guided Learning Pathway.